It's time for another episode of Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina, featuring interviews with leaders and influencers across a variety of manufacturing disciplines discussing trending topics in the industry. Let's Talk Manufacturing is part of the Let's Talk Business South Carolina Network of B2B talk shows and brought to you by the South Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership. And now, coming to you from the Drum Creative Studio, here's your host, longtime South Carolina business publisher, Rick Jenkins. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina, episode number two. We're coming to you from Drum Creative Studios, and I am your host, Rick Jenkins. Let's Talk Manufacturing is produced in conjunction with the South Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership. SCMEP is a proven resource for the state's manufacturers, providing them with strategies and solutions to improve performance and profitability. Today's episode is brought to you by Burr and Foreman, one of the premier law firms in the Southeast. This firm includes more than 350 attorneys, and manufacturing has been an area of expertise for them for a long time. Burr and Foreman has been doing business for more than a century, and their manufacturing experience dates back to the early 1900s. We'll hear from those guys in just a moment. Here's the lineup for today's show. First, Andy Carr, the CEO at SCMEP, will share how manufacturers can take advantage of SCMEP's free tech assessment. Plus, he'll tell you how you can snag their new manufacturing resource guide. And then we'll hear from Andy Kurtz, the CEO at Copus, a Greenville-based consulting firm specializing in custom software development, data warehousing, and business intelligence solutions. We'll talk about the rapid advancement of technology, especially in areas like artificial intelligence and automation, and I'll ask Andy what he sees as the next big wave of innovation that's going to hit the industry. And once again, we'll hear from MAU Workforce Solutions. They specialize in staffing, recruiting, and outsourcing solutions, and manufacturing is their specialty. And in our featured segment, Kelvin Bird will join us. Kelvin is the Dean of Industrial Manufacturing at Greenville Technical College, and he's responsible for the oversight of the Center for Manufacturing Innovation, or CMI. He'll share how that organization assists manufacturers in meeting their workforce needs. All right, let's take a quick 60-second break. Check out this brief message from Doug Lineberry. He's a partner at Burr and Foreman, our presenting partner, and we will be right back. Hello, my name is Doug Lineberry. I'm an intellectual property attorney with Burr Foreman LLP. Uh, today, we're very happy to be presenting this episode of Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina. With respect to any manufacturing situation, whether it's a solo venture or whether you're involved with a joint partner, intellectual property is still a key tenant of this interaction. We want to make certain that you understand that when you're going into business with someone, you find out how they protect their intellectual property. Are they having to track down reticent employees, trying to uh, basically enforce non-disclosure agreements, you know, figure out what their past track record is. You know, if you've got some doubts about how things should be handled, make certain that you take precautions for your own intellectual property. You also want to understand the intellectual property ownership issues. Who owns what from the relationship? You know, at the end of the day, when the product's complete, who owns it? If there are any patents involved, who are those going to belong to? And also remember that all four facets of intellectual property, whether they be patent, trademark, copyright, or trade secret, all are involved in a manufacturing process, and you want to make certain that you've considered each of those before any public disclosures, ownership, etc. is determined. Welcome back, everyone, to Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina. Thanks once again to our presenting partner, Burr and Foreman. They are one of the premier law firms in the Southeast, and they've been doing business for more than 100 years in their manufacturing experience dates back to the early 1900s. I appreciate those guys partnering with us on this episode, and I also appreciate SMEP. As always, Let's Talk Manufacturing is produced in conjunction with those guys, the South Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and now it's time to spend 10 minutes with the CEO at SCMEP, and that's Andy Carr. Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rick. It's good to be here. It is good to have you back. Uh, and if folks you don't know, Andy joins us uh, on every episode of Let's Talk Manufacturing, and we uh, talk about technology and all kinds of fun stuff. And today, I want to talk First, about NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. That's right. And you guys are affiliated with those. Tell me first who they are and how does that affiliation work? 
Um, so yeah, National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Um, they're in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, and uh, if you've been in manufacturing, you might know them because they're the people that actually control the nation's standards, um, you know, in terms of measurements, weights, everything like that. But the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program is actually under them. So U.S. Department of Commerce, um, they are over NIST, and then we are under them. So NIST, basically, NIST MEP provides the funding for SCMEP and the other 50 uh, MEPs throughout the country. So one in every state and one also in Puerto Rico. Got it. And the federal funds come uh, down through NIST, and of course, uh, from a state perspective, that comes from the state uh, Department of Commerce, right? Uh, yes, yeah, that's our state stakeholder is the South Carolina Department of Commerce. And the MEP model, Rick, is always a public-private partnership. So we have public funds uh, from NIST MEP, we have public funds from the South Carolina Department of Commerce, um, and then the private part comes from our clients, the actual manufacturers in South Carolina, when they pay for our services. Got it. NIST calls, and I'm reading here, NIST calls the technology-driven approach being used in the industry today smart manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that leads to what we call smart factories. And yeah. I'm assuming the more technology increases, the smarter our factories get. Uh, and, uh, and you all play a huge part in helping manufacturers in South Carolina understand technology, decide which technology they may want to implement, and helping them do that. Tell yeah. me about it. I think it is called a tech assessment. And it is free. It is. It is. So one thing, NIST can actually help with that as well. Um, at a very high level, they have a program that's called Matter Plus, M-E-T-T-R, and the plus sign. Um, and that gives manufacturers access to researchers, engineers, scientists, and technicians in the actual NIST National Labs. That's an incredible resource there. So anybody that's looking for advice, um, particularly around, see, uh, material, the physical, mechanical properties, or chemical properties of that, it really needs top-level research on that one. Mm -hmm. Those services are available. It's as simple as visiting the NIST website or the Matter Plus website and, you know, submitting a request for assistance there. So that's something that's there. It flies under the radar, um, but it's it's there, and it's, it's free to use. So that's a very, very powerful place to start with that. What does the tech assessment look like for you guys? Uh, I would assume that uh, manufacturers might reach out to you and yeah. begin a conversation. And then where do you all take it from there? Walk me through the logistics. Yeah, so the logistics, again, it's a free assessment, yep. Rick. And like any assessment we do for South Carolina manufacturers, that's where the NIST funding comes in is to let our, yep. you know, our team go out there and do those assessments. Um, and, and, and our focus is the small and medium-sized guys. So what we're always looking to do is make sure they don't get behind in these exciting new technologies um, they have, you know, there's a fear or a perception that they're expensive, you know, they're for the BMWs and the Bosches of the world, and, and they are, and those companies are taking and making, you know, tremendous gains with them, but the small and medium-sized guys, it's there. And our role is to help educate them, right, you know, and the small and medium-sized guys, the guys with less than 500 employees, to say, well, you know, you need to understand it. We want to help you make an informed decision around about this technology. So that's where the assessment would come in there. We discussed the technology itself, but there's so many other things mm -hmm. um, and part of the company that you need to look at to determine it will be successful. Is the leadership, are they open to it? Do they understand it? Um, is there a strategy around it by that? And where is that strategy going to take the company there? What's the culture? Is it a company that's open and going to be receptive at all levels to adopt new technology? What's the impact on the operations in that specific part? Um, and is it going to help the company grow? And ultimately, what we're trying to do is educate them and give them that confidence to make an informed decision and ultimately be able to see, yes, this technology will have a positive return on investment. Right. So logistics, right? I mean, it would be one, maybe two members of our team coming in for a conversation with key individuals yeah. in the organization. And we're going to ask about 40 questions, take some notes, um, you know, develop a score, and then bring that report back and it's going to list um, you know, our findings and our recommendations. Right. And there's, yeah, again, no cost and there's no obligation for it. You also have um, another um, uh, resource guide uh, that I think just came out here recently. And uh, let's see, what's it called? The Manufacturing Resource Guide. Tell me about it. It, it. is. Right. And it's In also fact, free. It, yeah. Yep. It's also free to download. Yep. Okay. Yeah. This is a paper copy because right. it presents better Layout? here. Yeah, absolutely. I do want it back, though. Uh, you uh, get it back. You'll get but it's available to download as a PDF from our website. Um, and uh, 
Well, I am so thrilled about this. This has been about nine months work here um, for the MEP. And again, using that NIST funded to help pull, pull this together. Right. Uh, very fortunate we worked with Andy Henderson uh, here in Greenville to pull it together. He's done a fantastic job for us. Um, and, uh, you know, three main sections there, Rick. So what it's going to do is it's going to provide some technology background, uh, very much written in a layman's language. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole idea is that folks can read this and understand what that technology does. Um, and then we back that up with some use cases. You know, right. when might this technology be applicable? What sort of problems could it solve? Uh, and what do you need to consider? What are the advantages of it? And then what are some of the drawbacks of this, this technology? So we've got that. We look at the eight different technologies, including additive, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, cybersecurity, data connectivity. It's all in there. Man, you got all eight of them. You just oh, yeah. rattled that off. I'm sitting here looking at it thinking, you know, I'm going to help the guy. You know, I'll tell him what it is. You got all eight of them. Very impressive. Yeah, so th three sections. Take the overview of the tech, the use cases, and then, of course, the resources. The resources as well. And right. that, that was the driving point, Rick, is to make sure that people know who's out there to help them, who they are, what they do, how to get in touch with them. Um, and, you know, what kind of service to ex expect from them. So that features uh, people in the academic sector. It features people in the not-for-profit sector. Um, and then also the government resources that are available out there. Because the, the whole idea is it's out there just a lot of times, and particularly small, and small medium-sized manufacturers, you know, where people wear a lot of hats, right. they don't have the time to go out there and research this. And, right. you know, we did, and we have the resources and we were able to do that. And we wanted to put it in one convenient place. Yep. So, yeah, it's it's 103 pages, I think. Yeah. You're not intended, you know, the attention is not that you read it from cover to cover. Yeah. But it's searchable. You can dive in, keyword search it, you know, and when you're interested in a particular thing, just dive in and, you know, you'll be able to find, you know, those resources, that advice. Um, and, uh, yeah, very proud of it. You can tell. I'm like a dog. That you should be. It's, yes. You're right. It's it's like your baby. org. You can download it. That's right. Yep. And we featured um, under the new program section on our website. Um, and yeah, frankly, yeah, yeah, it'll be hard for you to miss this in the next few but, weeks. Of course. We will be promoting it. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt. If a uh, manufacturer needs assistance with pretty much anything, they just pick up the phone and call you guys, right? That's that's what we try to be. That's, we try to be what the you number are. one resource for manufacturers in South Carolina. Yep. Andy, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. Folks, that's Andy Carr. He is the CEO at the South Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or SCMEP. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in about 60 seconds. I bet you want a website that drums up business. You see, every business wants to have an effective online presence that helps their business grow. We guide you through our process that will drive results by clarifying your message with a beautiful design that's strategically optimized for search. Stop wasting your time and money on an ineffective website and let us help you drum up business by designing a website that speaks to your audience and delivers results. Welcome back everyone to Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina. Thanks once again to our presenting partner, Burr and Foreman. They are one of the premier law firms in the Southeast. The firm includes more than 350 attorneys and match manufacturing is an area of expertise, and they have been dealing with that for more than a century. All right, let's get on with the show. Technology, we talk about it a lot on this show. Technology in the advanced manufacturing world has been increasing in a frantic pace for many, many years now, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. New technologies on the plant floor have created smart factories, and smart factories rely on internet-connected machinery. All of that means IT now plays a bigger role than ever before in the manufacturing industry. Just how big? Well, here to help answer that question is Andy Kurtz. Andy is the CEO at Copus, one of South Carolina's premier IT firms. Andy, welcome. Thanks, Rick. Good to be here. It is good to have you. Uh, you know, I'm very familiar with, with your company, of course. Um, I've been in South Carolina for more than 20 years, so I'm quite familiar with Copus. But you and I had never met until yep. you arrived for the show. It's a pleasure to meet you. Where are you from? Originally from Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. Yeah, Buffalo, New York. My goodness, I'm glad you came down here. From yeah, Florida. I'm truly a halfback because uh, when I was in high school, my dad transferred to Tallahassee, Florida. Yep. And in trying to pick where do I want to go to college, it's like, well, I don't want to be here, but I don't want to go back up there. That's so, right. 
circled the Carolinas, and yeah. Greenville was the place. Before we talk about technology, tell me just a little bit about Copus. Uh, you guys, of course, headquartered uh, in Greenville and the upstate. Yeah. doing business everywhere. We are. We're doing business uh, really all across the country and, and even some internationally. Uh, we're an IT services firm, as you mentioned. We specialize in both building software, where it doesn't exist for, for organizations, and also implementing uh, Microsoft Cloud solutions, Dynamics ERP solutions, Dynamics sales, um, help organizations modernize, visualize data. Right. Got it. All right. So let's talk about technology in the manufacturing world. I mean, uh, here on this show, uh, it's basically 80% of what we talk about. You know, we talk about tons of technology, some workforce challenges and that kind of thing, which I also want to touch base on yep. today a little bit. But let's talk tech. And I want to start way back, okay, when, when your parent, uh, maybe your dad and my dad, if they had manufacturing jobs a generation ago, it looked a heck of a lot different than it does today. Yes, it what did technology look like back in my dad's day? Well, I think it was mostly mechanical. Yeah. Technology is what they were taking advantage of. Is, right. is obviously we had, um, prior to that, really prior to the turn of the century, we had just people doing all the work with tools. And then, um, obviously, in the Industrial Revolution, we had machinery created and machinery that could automate to some extent i'm going to use it was a very um early form of automation yeah. but certainly able to do things a lot faster assembly line and in reality i don't think there were dramatic certainly not dramatic it based technology changes that uh really our our parents would have seen on the on the yeah, plant floor exactly. um, it was an individual machine and and people running it people setting it up Right. A lot of manual effort uh, yeah. around every aspect of... And, and companies like yours, I would assume, became way, way more important in the industry uh, in the late 90s when the internet, uh, you know, became available. And let's get to that here in just a sec. But let's try, you know, fast forward a generation, all right? And so now you and I, we walk out to a manufacturing floor at BMW, which you can eat off their floors, by the way. It's amazing. It's clean. And now we have technology uh, that is light years ahead of what it was. Give me, and we could go in a hundred different directions here, Andy, but just give me a couple of technologies that you feel have just transformed the industry uh, just in the past, you know, 10 years. I should know, to me, when I look at technology and I look at manufacturing, it starts with better decision-making. Um, how can I make it the right decision faster? Mm -hmm. And then that leads to, if you're confident you can make the right decision faster, automation. Right. So it all starts with data. Because in order to make the right decision, I need, you need data. And so you look at um, IoT and the Internet of Things and the ability to put sensors on just about everything and collect that data and get it stored somewhere. Okay, now we have a lot of data that we can do a lot with. And so now I need to be able to analyze it. Now, now it's almost so much data, can a human analyze it? And so right. the introduction of... Uh, of AI-based technologies like machine learning is one of the, mm -hmm. the ones that's more mainstream mm -hmm. right now. Um, and the ability to learn from that data, continuously learn from that data and start to build out models that take that data in real time and make help either people make better real-time decisions or take it one step further. How do we leverage that to automate, to have um, the right decision automatically implemented? And to me, though, that's the big, the big change. Yeah. And, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, we were talking before we came on the air. Uh, it seems like every week, whether I'm on Let's Talk Business or, or this show, Let's Talk Manufacturing, we're talking about AI in some form or fashion. Every industry has been impacted. I can't think of an industry that is not impacted in one way or another by artificial intelligence. I can't even begin to fathom where AI is going to continue to go. It's moving so fast, right? It is. And, and you know, we, AI is a term that you can kind of look at and it's a, what does it really mean? Exactly. So I, I even think back to some of the automation we have was somewhat AI. It was just very discreet. We told it, if this happens, do this type of AI. But we were still building artificial intelligence in to some level. Now with machine learning taken at another level, now we have generative AI where it's starting to be able to, the AI is able to consume large, large volumes of, of information and communicate with us. Yeah. And, and so where is it going to go? I think to me, the big thing is I don't really totally know where it's going to go, 
But at the same time, there have been a couple of really pivotal technologies that you just know are going to change the future. You know, the internet was one of them. When, when that was first came out, I couldn't have predicted all the things. Could have predicted some of them, but not all of them that, we, yeah. that we've implemented. Certainly mobility and, and the, the ideas and, and the changes in our life that has come about for mobility. And I think AI is the next one yeah. that, that's, that's there. It, it's definitely a technology that you, I think, have to adopt right. at some level. So I've actually used the phrase before, you can adopt AI or you can be what I've coined as Amish, which is AI Amish. And just, I'm going to bury my head and pretend it doesn't exist. Right. And I don't think that's as a business organization, yeah. or quite frankly, any organization trying to deliver quality products or services. I don't think you have the luxury of burying your head and pretending it doesn't exist. Let's stick in the manufacturing industry. Give me some ways that manufacturers these days are using artificial intelligence. What types of challenges are they tackling with the assistance of AI? Well, certainly there's things like um, quality detection. So the ability, I mentioned the ability to um, uh, get a lot of information. So whether that's visual information with cameras taking pictures mm -hmm. uh, of things, whether that's um, uh, information that's coming from sensors that, that's, that are measuring different characteristics of a product that's being built. And it's the measurements and, and the, the in, for instance, the pictures, all of that is at a level of detail that requires AI to process it at a speed that's fast enough to say that there's a problem, but it can also look at it at a level of detail and granularity and consistency that a person just can't do. So leveraging AI for quality, I think, is, is a huge one. Um, leveraging AI for product development improvement. So it's kind of a, a looking back and saying, we're looking at the products coming off the line we're looking at production information and we're marrying those up and we're saying we we have good product when these characteristics exist we have bad product on these help you adjust the um the manufacturing environment and, and the way things are running to try to produce a more consistent product and there are opportunities to leverage ai to automatically adjust uh the environment and not to have wait for a person to intervene. But another big one to me with AI, and especially with this generative AI thing uh, that, 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 that's become so mainstream in the last year and a half, and also if I want to throw in augmented reality and virtual reality uh, as part of this as well, is the ability to help upskill the workforce. We have the ability to put in people's hands and then for them to communicate with AI where somebody doesn't necessarily need to have the experience of how to do something. They can communicate and get answers that, that help them become better at their job without requiring years of experience to get better at their job. So that upskilling to me is one of the other big areas that I, I think that's going to be one of the big growth areas. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying. So are you saying that maybe there is a person on the plant floor and he or she is performing some task and uh, instead of going to ask a, a supervisor or waiting for a supervisor to get there, they will have some way uh, a chat bot uh, yep. of some That's sort, uh, right? Yep. To where they can ask a question and get answers real time while they're doing, is that? What you're exactly, to? to me, there's a huge opportunity with generative AI to take institutional knowledge mm -hmm. that you know historically might have been in somebody, the, te the technician who's been here for 30 years. Yeah. Um, whatever that institutional knowledge is, collect that, put it into a private, database, but right. it's, 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 it's a company asset, right. and turn that into something that's accessible right. in close to real time for people as they're trying to solve problems. So they're doing it based on policy, based on experience, and they're leveraging the knowledge that, that right. the uh, institution is carrying over the years. Yeah, interesting. Yep, I think it's uh, exciting. Yeah, certainly. Uh, you mentioned a little bit ago, you don't know where AI is going to go, and so let's go there for a minute and a little levity for a sec, guys. Back in 1984, I believe, I'm a senior in high school, and there was a movie that came out called The Terminator uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it was the first time that, uh, you know, I was aware of what they would call artificial intelligence, even though I don't believe it was called that then. Maybe it was. I don't, I don't recall. But we all know how that, that played out, and I certainly don't anticipate anything like that happening. However, there is real concern. Uh, with artificial intelligence about where it might go and the fact that we really need to regulate it and keep a keep an eye on it. Uh, so tell me, um, 
for, first of all, to what degree is something like the Terminator even possible? And I'm not talking about people coming from, you know, time travel. I'm just talking about uh, uh, being sentient in yeah. a way. I think there's a risk. Yeah. Just in all honesty, that, right. that um, the one of the biggest challenges is if you look at the time between change. Yeah. The time between advancements just keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Yep. Right. And now you have a new type of technology with this generative AI. Right. And so it's going to continue to evolve and it's going to go where, where opportunity is seen to leverage it. And legislating something and regulating something takes time. And I don't know if, if we have to accept the fact and understand there's a limited amount of time. Yeah. To, to basically make sure that we put the right constraints and controls around AI. So I think it's important to, to, to do something quickly because I do think there's risk that we, I, I don't think on plant floor necessarily, right? There's not that risk, but from, from a uh, existential standpoint, there's the, there's the risk of, right. hey, we've turned decisions over to AI and yeah. we haven't really fully tested and vetted and we don't know, but we thought it was the best thing to do and that right. what we, Hate to do is wake up one day and find out we're full. Okay, Andy, I'm going to get you out of here on this. Uh, we're talking about innovation, 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 and technology, technology. Give us an example or, or tell us what you think might be the next big thing. And it could just be an extension of what we already have, of course. But uh, what do you think? I'll be honest. I, think, I don't think the next big thing is any new technology that we don't have the foundation of today. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be generative AI based and it's going to be where do we take, where do we apply generative AI? Right. So like I, I mentioned earlier, the fact that when the internet came, it, it took many years to yeah. really take advantage and full advantage of, of the internet. People's mind had to brass around what's possible, yeah. had to try things. And I think, so I think the next big thing is going to be what we, how we leverage Generative AI. Right. I think you're probably right. Good conversation, Andy. I appreciate Same it. Here. I really enjoyed it. I did too. Folks, that is Andy Kurtz. He is uh, the CEO at Copus, one of the uh, premier IT firms, not only in South Carolina, but in the Southeast. Appreciate you uh, joining us for this segment. Don't go anywhere, though. Uh, we're going to be right back here in about 60 seconds. See you soon. I bet you want a website that drums up business. You see, every business wants to have an effective online presence that helps their business grow. We guide you through our process that will drive results by clarifying your message with a beautiful design that's strategically optimized for search. Stop wasting your time and money on an ineffective website and let us help you drum up business by designing a website that speaks to your audience and delivers results. Welcome back, everyone, to Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina. Thanks once again to our presenting partner, Burr and Foreman. They are one of the premier law firms in the Southeast with more than 350 attorneys working across the Southeast, and manufacturing is one of their target industries, having provided legal assistance to manufacturers for well more than a century. We often talk about workforce challenges on this show. We also talk about it on Let's Talk Business and Let's Talk Construction. It's a hot topic regardless of the industry. Here to help me continue that discussion is Emily Heflin. Emily is a Senior Business Development Director at MAU Workforce Solutions. MAU specializes in equipping advanced manufacturers with the workforce needed to help run today's smart factories. Emily, welcome. Good to see you, Rick. It is good to have you here. We were talking before we came on the air. We hadn't seen each other in a while, so it's nice to catch up. Yeah, good to see you again. You know, manufacturing, uh, everybody, every industry has workforce issues and has trouble hiring people. That's the nature of the gigs today, right? But manufacturing is one that I, that's a little bit troubling. I mean, we've got a lot of jobs in manufacturing to fill. Many jobs, important jobs. And when those jobs don't get filled, especially on a manufacturing floor, you lose efficiency. And sometimes you hire people that maybe you shouldn't have hired from within just because you got to get that job filled. Give me, give me a thought. Why are we having trouble finding these people to fill jobs? Cool jobs. Yeah. 
I think it's what we were talking about earlier before we got started is the the cool factor of the whole thing, right? Manufacturing has had the perception of, um, you know, lower paying jobs, these long shifts, not really any flexibility. Um, maybe you're not treated as is with as much respect as maybe in some other jobs. So I think that's that's created kind of um, a little a little bit with the problem and. Um, you know, so there's manufacturers out there, as you said, cool jobs, doing cool things. A lot of our clients have experimented with different ship models. And, you know, that there's there's a lot of technology out there in manufacturing. And so telling that story to di- uh, to just you know, dismiss that myth right. is really important. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. There's a stigma there that we have trouble uh, getting rid of. But as I've said before on this show, this ain't your daddy's manufacturing. A lot of cool stuff to do out there. Moms and dads need to be well aware of it. You know, as as technology continues to increase at a crazy rate, we, we have smart factories. And the smarter they are, uh, I think, you know, the higher tech that, that there is and the more tech that there is, the more help we need to run those smart factories. Is it possible? that with so much technology and so many things happening in today's advanced manufacturing world that people are just pulled in so many directions that they don't spend enough time on developing a workforce that they might have a decade ago. Yeah, so with with technology and all the advancements now, things are moving much quicker. Mm -hmm. The business cycle is much quicker and decisions are having to be made quicker. Candidates are having to get through process quicker. Mm-hmm. This things are just moving so much quicker. So that makes it even more important to really double down and focus on, okay, what is my core business, my core critical business? And maybe there's some things out there like recruiting that you may kind of have to let go of to, so that they can get the focus that they need. Right. Um, to fill all of those jobs that are yeah. out there. I want to make sure I, I understand, because we were having a discussion about this. I think you're saying that a manufacturer has core functions and non-core functions, and the core functions take so much time these days, and maybe uh, the hiring process is kind of a non-core function and gets pushed aside. And that's kind of what I'm hearing you say, right? So how can manufacturers manage that process uh, in a way that doesn't impede uh, their ability to handle the core functions. Sure. So, uh, so I always go back to, to focus and time. So in your core critical functions, that's where you're going to want to focus your, your time and, and your, and your efforts. When you have something that's non-core yet critical, which hiring would be, cr- recruiting would be that you have to stop and think, okay, how, what, how can we give the time and the focus that needs to be there for those while it's it's non-core to making whatever you make, but it's still critical for efficiencies and quality and really getting product out the door. Right. You, of course, work for MAU Workforce Solutions, and, and, and you guys specialize in manufacturing, and you have for many, many years. It's a target industry mm-hmm. for you, of course. So you're having these conversations all the time with manufacturers. Um, what is it, you know, what is it that a manufacturer needs to look for in an outfit like yours um, to make them realize that this is who I need uh, to to run these processes for me, what are they looking for? Sure. So we always talk about, um, no pun intended, we have a lot of automotive manufacturing here, and we always talk about lifting up the hood. Uh-huh, right. And what we, what we mean by that is really lifting up the hood of that hiring process and really understanding what are the must-haves? What are the, okay, nice to have, but maybe if we didn't have that as part of our hiring process, we'd be okay because really it's about moving candidates through efficiently and right. rapidly. Um, and so really doubling down on that on that hiring process and also taking an analysis and looking at the overall market. So not just wages, but looking at, at wages, looking at commuting patterns, mm-hmm all the competitors around the area and really drafting a strategy around that. So what you really want to be talking about your, your um, staffing provider with is, is all of those different pieces and around taking those different pieces and really crafting 
a marketing strategy to really tell your story. Because as we said before, mm -hmm. there are a lot of cool jobs out there. There's a lot of technology. That's what candidates are looking for, especially this Gen Z coming in. So it's really it's it's really taking a deep dive into that and checking and adjusting um, right. accordingly. Well, I'll get you out of here on this. And you brought up Gen Z. And so let's stick on that a minute. Your colleague, Jared Mogan, uh, Vice President of Operations for mm -hmm. MAU, joined me in the last episode. And we talked about Gen Z folks, or as a lot of folks are calling today, Zoomers. Uh, and we talked about how Zoomers are different than Boomers mm -hmm. uh, and that they require a different style of management. Uh, with those guys, it tends to be sometimes about um, uh, projects, yeah. uh, not necessarily, um, you know, titles and that kind of thing in terms of what's most important to them. Sure. What do manufacturers have to do today to uh, manage this this new different type of generation? So uh, I always I always say is is thinking differently. So what worked for John and, and understanding what is motivating your generation that goes back to looking at your over, the overall market that you're in and what is what is the the generation of the market that you're in and you tailor your strategy around that so if it's it's with the the zoomers um they're not they're interested in more of the flexibility they are interested in the the technology and the advanced manufacturing that's what they grew up with right and that's what they know um and so telling that story offering those opportunities offering opportunities for upskilling and advancement. And, you know, they're not really interested in the hierarchy, the traditional hierarchy um, and, and job titles. Like you said, it's more around skills and projects and, and around the flexibility. Lots of changes in manufacturing. It comes uh, quick. It's frantic. Uh, and our advanced manufacturers out there have to keep up. Emily, good job. Thanks for the info. Thanks for having me, Rick. You are welcome, folks. That's Emily Heflin. She is the Director of Business Development for MAU Workforce Solutions. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with our next guest in about 60 seconds. I bet you want a website that drums up business. You see, every business wants to have an effective online presence that helps their business grow. We guide you through our process that will drive results by clarifying your message with a beautiful design that's strategically optimized for search. Stop wasting your time and money on an ineffective website and let us help you drum up business by designing a website that speaks to your audience and delivers results. Welcome back everyone to Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina. Thanks once again to our presenting partner, Burr and Foreman. They are one of the premier law firms in the Southeast and they have been assisting manufacturers for more than 100 years now. Our featured guest today is Kelvin Bird. Kelvin is the Dean of Advanced Manufacturing and Transportation Technologies at Greenville Technical College, and he oversees the day-to-day -day operations at the Center for Manufacturing or Innovation for Innovation. Kelvin, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It is good to have you here, man. You joined me on an episode of Let's Talk Business quite some time ago, and yeah. uh, I've seen you a couple times since then, but uh, I'm glad to have you back. Oh, yeah. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. We are talking about, uh, we've been talking about uh, workforce development issues for quite some time in all industries. And if folks watch Let's Talk Business, they know we talk about it about every single industry. It's a problem a little bit of everywhere. That is no different than the manufacturing industry. Lots of workforce types of challenges. And the Center for Manufacturing Innovation, which uh, you oversee, uh, is built uh, for that in a way. Oh, yeah. And, and so I want to get into that. Mm -hmm. But before we talk about the workforce challenges themselves, let's talk about uh, CMI. Now, it was founded, I believe, in 2013. Am I right about that? Somewhere in that I, ballpark? I'm going to say more, more like 2016. Like, I mean, seven, 2016. Eight, 20, yeah, seven, eight years ago, 2016. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, uh, Greenville Tech, I believe they spearheaded this, but they had partners. Yes. Uh, they had mm -hmm. folks uh, that they worked together and still work together with mm -hmm. in terms of a partnership to bring this to reality. And one of them was Clemson University, and there were others. Tell us how it all began. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question, you know, because a lot of people, you know, behind the scenes sometimes don't know what actually goes on. And, right. and sometimes out in the community want to kind of understand how did all this kind of, you know, right. transpire. Um, and, and it's interesting that you asked that question because, 
you know, Gravel Tech has done a great job with training individuals for years um, mm-hmm. and preparing them to go out into the industry with multiple skill sets. And so when we started this whole initiative um, under Dr. Keith Miller, you know, the, the idea was to uh, build a facility that would allow us to create uh, partnerships on a totally different level. Mm-hmm. You know, not just with business and industry or different organizations or ins- institutions just setting up time to come in with us and meet with us and then they leave and they go their own separate ways, but create an environment that would allow them to come in and 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 be in this facility with us, you know, create a landing spot for them to be with us daily um, throughout the day uh, and create, you know, relationships with students, uh, business and uh, industry, with faculty and staff. Um, and so we wanted to create a totally different environment. And so the conversation took place with Clemson University very, very quickly because, as a lot of people know, CUI car is, is right there right. Um, in that same complex. Mm-hmm. And so they reached out to us um, because um, they were doing a great job in, in expanding um, their research behind the automotive industry. And they felt like that was a great opportunity to reach out to Granville Tech, knowing that we're going to be there. Hey, let's kind of create a partnership if we can. Um, and so it was a two-way conversation. Um, and right now, you know, Clemson, um, they lease out about, uh, uh, maybe not lease, but we have allocated about 10,000 square foot space for them to do automotive research. Right. Um, and with that partnership, this is, the, this is the key thing to the whole process is that it has created opportunities for our students, uh, meaning that, Clemson has PhD students who are in this building with us, in this facility, and all students um, primarily are there to earn a two-year social degree. Mm-hmm. And so we have taken those two and we put them together and married them together. And it has created a very unique partnership. Um, and they work together on different projects throughout the year, um, doing research and development, mm-hmm. um, whether it's something that they do internally or something that they do externally. So. Well, uh, let's talk about the facility for a second. Oh, I've yeah. been out there, and if you if you haven't been out to, to the facility, I would encourage you to stop by yeah. uh, and, and just take a look because it's absolutely gorgeous facility. Mm-hmm. And you've got all kinds of stuff that is happening in there, right? <laughs> you, you've got uh, kind of a section for additive manufacturing. Oh, yeah. When you walk in the door over here, you've got you've got office space, of course, for yourself and many others, but tons of places you alluded to, tons of place on the floor for students. Uh, to uh, get their hands dirty, so to speak, oh, yeah. and, and, oh, yeah. and do things hands-on. Oh, yeah. Tell us about all that's in that facility. Yeah. Well, I, I would first start off by saying that this facility is not your, I would say, traditional uh, facility that we are accustomed yeah. to. When we, right. when we, The way we was raised and brought up, we go into manufacturing and we see the dirty, the gritty, the oily type facilities. It's totally different. Uh, we've created a, an environment that lines up with what business and industry is doing now. It's very clean, That's right. very professional. Um, and when you walk in there, we have a mechatronics program where we're teaching students everything as it relates to mechanical, electrical, hydraulics, and pneumatics, and robotics, uh, PLCs. Uh, we also have our machine to manual machine and CNC. Uh, we have our electrical engineering program that's mm-hmm. in this facility now, our engineering design program, um, and then our last program that we house in there is our advanced manufacturing um, program that allows students to earn not a two-year social degree, but a four-year degree in advanced manufacturing. Um, this facility has a lot of just very innovative equipment. You know, mm-hmm. we have robotics, we have 3D printing, we have additive manufacturing. Right. We also have our continued ed where we um, allow individuals to come in and companies where we allow them to have an, op- an atmosphere and an, a place where they can come and get PD, professional development training for business and industry. Where right. We're teaching them about, right. you know, Lean Six Sigma, where they can earn, mm-hmm. you know, um, black belt, yellow belt, green belt, all those different things. So we create an environment that allows people to come in and go your traditional format of fall, spring, um, summer semester, but we also have it where people can come in and go through our continued ed program and we can customize um, curriculum for them to help right. um, provide people with that quick, fast training, get them in and get them out and back into the workforce. All right, so uh, let's get back to continuing it. So not only uh, can uh, you know students that are out of high school, let's say, go in there to, to begin or further their education to get them into a manufacturing facility, but in this day and age, upskilling is awfully important. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I mean, when we're dealing with workforce challenges, it's not – 
and you're having trouble sometimes filling all your positions, you got to upskill a little more than maybe you have in the past. Does CMI work, I'm assuming they do, work with manufacturers to, to say, you know, manufacturing X is, hey, look, I need you to help these six employees go from this type of job to that type of job. How does that work? Yeah. So um, just for example, and, and I'm a, I'm a, it's kind of hard to just identify one company because we have multiple sure. companies that we do this for. But I'm going to use, for example, you may take GE. Uh, GE may reach out to us and say we have um, some maintenance technician that we need you know, to train. Right. Um, and we, we only need them in there for maybe five or six weeks. Um, or we may need them to go through a traditional format to complete a certificate or degree. What what can you all do? So what we do, we bring them in and we, we bring them to the table and we bring our faculty to the table. The instructors who are actually in the classroom teaching day in and day out. Mm -hmm. They are the expert. Mm -hmm. And we have them sit in there and creating an uh, environment and having a conversation centered around what their needs are and what we can do. So they have... Uh, some valuable input um, GE does right. and, and telling us what they're looking for. And then we lay that out. We map that out and we try to cater our curriculum a little bit to align what their needs are. Um, there are some cases where we can align it up directly and there are some cases where we may have to tweak it a little bit. Right. When we have those type of conversations with them, then we bring in uh, uh, another area um, at the college that deals with um, apprenticeships. And those type of things, and if we need to line apprenticeships mm -hmm. in place and line that up to meet their needs, we let them know that their services are there too. They have support them, um, but it happens uh, with those type of conversation, mm -hmm. you know, with them. Right. Um, and then sometimes we can curate a class just for that company and and have a cohort of individuals just for that particular company, mm -hmm. GE, and that way. The students who they hire, or individuals that they bring in from their company, can stay together, mm. and then they can work together as a team on projects. They can work together in trying to solve problems, and and that they're going to be faced with when they go back to GE. Right. Um, and so those type of conversations take place, um, and that's how that conversation is started, and that's how that whole format is kind of put together. You know, that's I think that's what. Um, um, I like the most about CMI. It's not just that you all have programs there, and uh, if you want to take part in them, you come in and sign me. Take yeah. care. You all are, are a true partner to oh, manufacturers. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. And it, that partnership is what is most valuable. I, very, you know, very. For, from someone st out here looking in, it's that <laughs> partnership that I oh, think yeah. is the success yeah. of CMI. Yeah, it is. It really is. And we, we would love for more partnerships to take place. Uh, we have found out that um, in some cases, a lot of, um, you know, the industry do not know about how we can create that partnership, you mm -hmm. know, and, right. and, and create that curriculum for them. A lot of them are not aware of that's how easy it can be done. Yeah. And so that's a challenge for us sometimes by getting the word out there. But um, it's that easy. And so, Kevin, I appreciate you, man. Oh, yeah. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us, folks. That is Kelvin Bird. He is the Dean of Advanced, Advanced Manufacturing and Transportation Technologies at Greenville Technical College, and he also oversees CMI, or the Center for Manufacturing Innovation. And I would uh, greatly encourage you uh, to go out there, take a tour, look around, just walk through the door and look. It's a, it's a cool place. Uh, folks, that concludes another episode of Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.